Hereby, I open this uh, academic ceremony in which Mr. Michael Veldeman will defend his academic thesis entitled Diagnosis and Treatment of Early and Delayed Cerebral Injury After a Neuronal Subarachnoidal Hemorrhage. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. I give you the word for the next 15 minutes. Thank you, dear Prorector, dear members of the Assessment Committee, dear Professor Temel, Professor Klusman, Dr. Haren, dear audience, I would like to present you a short view into the research which has, which has led to this doctoral thesis. Since 2015, I've been involved in research focusing on a specific type of hemorrhagic stroke, which means bleeding within the skull, which is in this case caused by the rupture of a so-called cerebral aneurysm. Cerebral aneurysms are balloon-shaped extrusions of brain vessels, which are typically located at the base of the brain. Cerebral aneurysms develop during one's lifetime, and the exact cause is still debated. Aneurysms are fairly common, and they're found in up to 2% two to 3% of all people. Luckily, the majority of these aneurysms will never cause any harm. Only in a minority of patients, aneurysms are unstable, and often preceded by growth, they rupture. The resulting bleeding spreads in the so-called suprachnoidal space, which is located between two layers of connective tissue surrounding the brain, as is seen here in this brain scan. The bleeding continues until a blood clot is formed, patching the rupture site. But until this has occurred, patients will have suffered severe headache, might even lose consciousness, or even suffer sudden death. In patients surviving the initial hemorrhage, they go through a precarious phase during which they're susceptible to additional secondary damage to brain tissue. And a spastic narrowing of blood vessels to the brain play a crucial role in the imbalance between oxygen supply and demand which occurs. If this situation persists, it may lead to perishing of brain tissue, which is seen here in this brain scan as these dark spots, and may cause additional disability or even death. Many animal models have been developed to be able to better study and understand this disease. And as described in chapter two of this, of this thesis, we have surgically perforated brain arteries in 22 laboratory rats in order to simulate the rupture of an aneurysm. This model is typically used to assess early damage, which occurs after aneurysm rupture, but which later contribute to the development of additional secondary damage. And one of these processes is the activation of immune cells, which might potentially overreact and cause additional, potentially unnecessary damage to the brain. Xenon gas, despite being a noble gas and therefore chemically unreactive, exerts some remarkable biological effects. One of which is the induction of sedation. And xenon gas in appropriate concentrations is able to induce general anesthesia. One of these remarkable properties is also the increase of resilience of living tissue towards oxygen, oxygen and glucose shortage. We performed the first animal trial in which animals with subarachnoid hemorrhage were treated with xenon gas, after which their damaged brains were removed and microscopically examined. We performed basically a two-group comparison in which animals were either treated with xenon gas or without. In these experiments, damage to brain cells was 
measured and is seen here as these shrunken darker cells and was quantified in specific regions of the brain. And we observed that in animals previously treated with xenon gas, there was less damage to specific regions. And additionally, in those animals, we saw less activation of these overactive immune cells. In patients, in order to be able to treat this upcoming secondary additional damage, we first need to be able to identify it. The problem with patients who suffered subarachnoid hemorrhage is that they remain oftentimes in an unconscious state with, which lasts often several days after the aneurysm rupture. This means that the secondary damage might develop fully unnoticed and only becomes apparent when someone wakes up so it does, fails to wake up or wakes up with a neurological deficit. So invasive neuromonitoring is a technique in which probes, electrodes are placed inside of the brain and which are able to render additional information in regard to the state of surrounding brain tissue. We have been applying this technique in all unconscious suprachnoid hemorrhage patients since 2014. The goal of the research described in chapter three and four of this thesis was to evaluate whether this monitoring technique and this additional information delivers a benefit for patients on the long run. In order to achieve this, we compared patients who were monitored, monitored invasively to a group of patients who were treated in our department before this technique became available. All patients were followed up for at least one year and their state was assessed exactly after 12 months. We observed that in patients with these monitoring devices, less CT scans were performed and therefore they were exposed to less hurtful radiation. Additionally, we saw that in patients after, in the group in patients after placement of these monitoring devices, events of upcoming secondary damage were identified accurately and at an earlier stage. This resulted in earlier treatment of appropriate patients, which then translated in a high rate of favorable outcome, which is seen in this graph, where green and yellow represents patients who were able to lead an independent life without requiring daily assistance in their daily lives. So to summarize, in this thesis we have shown for the first time a neuroprotective effect of xenon gas in an animal model of suprachnoid hemorrhage. Additionally, we have demonstrated that invasive neuromonitoring can aid the clinician in identifying upcoming events of secondary damage earlier, and that earlier treatment in the adequately selected patient resulted in a higher rate of favorable outcome of patients who suffered suprachnoid hemorrhage. I thank you for your attention. I would like to give the word back to the protector. Thank you, Mr. Candidate, for your clear, short, and defined presentation. I think that gives us some extra time for some questionings in our deliberations. Thank you very much. So we're going to start you now the questionings, and the opposition will be opened by Professor Van Oostenbrugge, who was the chairman of your assessment committee and who is affiliated as professor in neurology at our university. And I'd like to give him the word as first opponent. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, dear candidate. First of all, I would like to congratulate you with this thesis in which you advocate the broader use of invasive monitoring in patients with an anaesthetic superior hemorrhage. And with that, I also congratulate your promotion team, um, especially the clinical observations observational study were intriguing and questions whether invasive monitoring should be included in routine clinical practice when, which we don't do in the Netherlands as you probably know. Um, 
On the other hand, the evidence seems rather weak to implement it broadly. Um, so just the first question, and you may ask, you may answer it briefly, because my um, the other opponent, Professor Van Swan, will go into more detail on this question. What's your opinion based on your studies, including the systematic review? Should we implement it in the Netherlands or not? Hi, Lucy opponent. Thank you for your question. Um, that is exactly the question we are trying to answer, whether um, this should be broadly recommended. Um, as also the um, elaborate literature research we did in chapter four of this research showed there are no randomized trials. So we don't go beyond um, class uh, evidence level two, class B, um, if you want to formulate a recommendation. Um, it's observational data. The observational data, especially um, in the trials we did, has some major drawbacks because it's a before and after analysis, which introduces uh, many kinds of performance bias and uh, detection bias, bias we cannot correct for. So the simple answer is um, if we want to upgrade our uh, evidence level, we need a randomized control trial um, in, in which an um, treatment algor algorithm only driven by clinical observation with or without imaging in some form, for example, perfusion sheet CT imaging versus an um, treatment or diagnostic algorithm driven by invasive neuromonitoring. Okay. And only such a trial will be able to answer that question and will be able to upgrade uh, current evidence. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are still not doing the wrong thing in the Netherlands, but I was wondering, maybe we should gain some experience, but that's up to my colleague. Um, I want to discuss with you in more detail chapter three. You showed that invasive monitoring is beneficial despite some safety concerns, um, but the two definitions of DCI were not clear to me, especially the, deviation, the definition used in the uh, post INM group. Mm -hmm. um, was it sufficient to define DCI in chapter three, so in the uh, high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, whenever oxygen and or metabolic derangements were present in patients with a poor-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage? Was that enough? Um, thank, you. thank you for your question. Um, one of the efforts of, of this set of trials was to extend the now leading clinical definition of DCI because it hampers us in detecting it in clinically unaccessible patients. Um, one of uh, the very important points you remark is um, whether one parameter, for example, only PT2 or lactate pyruvate ratio would be sufficient to substantiate the definition in practice and in these trials it was. And um, we believed that a single parameter as such would be sufficient um, to set the diagnosis in an unconscious patient where no other metabolic or um, respiratory condition could explain these apparent values. Um, one of the drawbacks of this technique, and as we have implemented it right now, is uh, rigid cutoff values because um, potentially, and that is also how we would like to advance, is that um, only applying rigid cutoff values if it is insufficient, we have to take the timely changes also into consideration. Sorry to interrupt you, but so it means that the earlier detection by one of those dearrangements in uh, um, would lead to an earlier diagnosis. You compare it with a group, and that's in your discussion also clear. Um, so it's the change in the diagnosis what led to an earlier detection. But is that the proof that invasive monitoring is beneficial, or should you, and the treatment algorithm, or should you compare it in a more or less trial way to see whether um, the um, predictive values of those dearrangements really lead to DCI? Because that's not clear. Um, so is it 
enough to have a, a little shift in your saturation or your oxygenation in your brain tissue um, that leads to all those bad outcomes. Is that really established? Um, the cutoff values we, we, we apply are observationally established um, and a persisting PTU2 PTU under 10 is associated with an unfavorable outcome as well as an LPR above 40. Okay. Um, that is established, um, but also again in observational data. Um, okay, mm -hmm. so putting this into the definition would help in defining more patient more accurately. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question, um, I skipped one. Uh, it's related to your log logistic regression analysis. You included DCI occurrence in your model as a confounder, as I understood it correctly. Um, and I wonder whether that was whether that is correct or that it is an interaction and that you have should have included an interaction term for your DCI occurrence. Um, in the in in the um, in the poor grade trial. Yep. Um, so you, yeah, you said in the poor grade study, um, you included oops, um, the Miller Fisher scale, which seems correct to me, mm -hmm. the Hunt has grade, but also the DCI occurrence as a predictor occurrence, a covariate. And I wonder if you put that one into your model, is your model then not um, going, is the regression not too much? And would you have better left it out and use it as an interaction term? Mm -hmm. um, the goal of, of, of the analysis was to correct for DCI occurrence. Um, and we also did a subgroup analysis of patients only with DC, DCI. Um, but then we were left with rather small groups. But um, the final question we wished to answer was, for the entire group of patients before DCI develops or not, um, would implementation of invasive neuromonitoring be beneficial? But if you correct for DCI, which was one of the outcomes you tried to prevent, I thought it's the, 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 the therapy or treatment is related, is, is in fact trying to prevent DCI, then it's not clear why you try to correct for it. It was one of the covariates used um, because exactly it's one of the major predictors of outcome. And um, when we would have left it out, I think that could have introduced a completely different kind of bias, um, which is um, otherwise, we considered it an, a valuable information to include in, into the model. I, I understand the limitation you uh, you remark. Um, to in fact, you say, and then what? There also was. Um, in fact, you say, and then we close. But in fact, you say, invasive monitoring is more than preventing DCI. That's what you say. Yeah. It has no effect on uh, occurrence of DCI. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's only um, a diagnostic tool. Yeah. Thanks for the answers and give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor Nimela, and he is affiliated as a professor in neurosurgery at the University of the Helsinki University Hospital. I would like to welcome him that he joins us this morning, and I would like to give him the word. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's uh, truly a pleasure and honor to be part of this academic tradition, which I, I like very much. Uh, I really would like to congratulate the candidate for an excellent thesis. Also, his supervisors and co-workers of a job very well done. And I really like the cover of the book. I have it here. Thank you for sending it now. So I have three questions for you. Uh, we still have problems with SAH patients, ICP, the amount of bleeding, uh, basal spasm. There are many things we don't know about, and you have 
enlightened us uh, about the lit existing literature very nicely and also have done, uh, done excellent studies. My first question is, in general, uh, about vasospasm. Uh, as we know, some patients, many patients have a radiological vasospasm, but then they don't have symptoms. Some people may have symptoms with a similar image. Why do you think that is? What are your speculations? Hi, um, esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for your question. Um, this is a crucial aspect of the pathophysiology of DCI. Um, it's the opposing sides between the initial historical idea of bleeding, blood degradation, blood degradation products leading to microvascular angiographic vasospasm causing these infarctions versus the now newly or in recent decades, in the recent decade established concept that it is the initial hemorrhage, the initial increase in ICP, the short lasting global ischemia, which causes damaging effects of which their effects only become visible after four to 14 days. Um, angiographic vasospasm, about two thirds of patients, half, two thirds of patients will develop them. Only half of them will become symptomatic. We don't treat them. Um, that's exactly the reason why we want to earlier measure these other contributing factor, factors, which include microvasospasm, microthrombosis, loss of autoregulation, failure in the neurovascular coupling, blood brain barrier disruption, and cortical spreading depolarization. Um, we believe that measuring PTO2 and having somewhat a measure of regional cerebral blood flow within the limits of um, brain autoregulation is um, superior than just measuring angiographic vasospasm or measure, measuring blood flow velocity via transcranial Doppler. Um, I hope that somewhat answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. And my second question is related to uh, artificial intelligence. So you have different parameters and we are talking a lot about artificial intelligence in, in, in the prognosis setting of SAH and trauma patients. So which would you choose and which of the parameters you think are like the top three most important ones if you would set up a model how to predict the prognosis of the patients in clinical setting to tell let's say the relatives of the patient how how the patient will be doing um thank you for your question um as i mentioned in one of the statements i think software and software interpretation and um, computer-aided decision making will in the future play a major role um, especially if, uh, as we're measuring um, so many more um, values and uh, the amount of data we're retrieving from patients is just mounting up from the measurements we did, partial oxygen pressure, lactate, pyruvate, there's glutamate, there's glycerol, there are the um, autoregulation indices, which, we, which are indicative of uh, poor prognosis in, SA, in uh, TBI, as well as in uh, suprachnal hemorrhage. Um, I think one big aspect of generating an um, risk assessment will be computer driven because a single human mind will not be able to assess the all probabilities which entail all of these measurements. Um, if you ask for right now the three most clinically usable, um, it will always remain at day one after bleeding, the initial clinical state and the amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage because both of them are major predictors of DCI occur occurrence. Um, and if we think about um, assessing DCI, the 
the clinical state of the patient in conscious patients will remain the most important. Um, and that was exactly the goal of this trial, to extend this into the unconscious patient. And as our, our data right now shows, are the two most valuable um, measurements in assessing unconscious patients to predict or diagnose DCI are partial pressure in oxygen and the lactate pyruvate ratio. Glucose sp um, plays a role, but um, there's also a um, physiological process which is called hyperglyconolysis in which glucose is metabolized faster. It's usually seen as a um, sign of recovery. And so measuring hypoglycemia interstitially using um, cerebral microdialysis, we did not use it in clinical practice exactly because of this reason, reason because it can go in, uh, in, in both ways. Low glucosis can mean recovery, can also mean lack of glucosis and potentially DCI. Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, very uh, thorough analysis. And my last question is, uh, how would you implement or extrapolate your experimental studies into human setting? And what do you think are the challenges? How to administer Xenon to humans? And what is the dosage? Um, thank you for your question. The Achilles heel of Xenon is, as I've mentioned before, its sedative effect. Um, which means it is not really wanted in someone who suffered subarachnoid hemorrhage at least um, after 24, 48 hours. So if there would be an application for xenon gas um, in a clinical context for subarachnoid hemorrhage, I would believe that the most usable way would be to use it as a narcotic gas during um, occlusion of the aneurysm, either um, surgical clipping or endovascular coiling or endovascular web device placement. So in the early phase, because what if we, we've now shown, that is it um, suppresses early brain injury and suppresses um, microglial activity. Um, and that would fit temporal um, in the timely um, phase of the disease well to use it exactly then uh, during the development of early brain injury, meaning within the first 24 to 48 hours. Thank you very much uh, for your answers. Uh, I'm very happy with them. I rest my case. Well, the opposition will be continued by Professor Van Swam. He is involved as uh, professor in neurointervention at our hospital here in Maastricht, and I would like to give him the word. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. <clears throat> Dear candidate, also my compliments for this uh, very nice and concise uh, book. I learned a lot again about a topic that I hardly know anything about, but I read also that many other people don't know much about it, so I'm not the only one. My compliments, of course, I extend to the team that supported you and uh, helped you to this uh, terrific uh, research. But I have a few questions that I would like to address. And Professor Van Oosterberg uh, said already that it's a bit in line with he says. You will learn that we work as team quite often together. But uh, <clears throat> I would like to go on to, at the moment, with your expert opinion or the evidence that you found, <clears throat> when you had to write a guideline on the use of invasive neuroimaging, what would be in that guideline? Which particular group would you advise to use invasive neuroimaging with, with weak evidence and low grade, etc.? Which group would you recommend and which kind of neuro, uh, invasive neuro monitoring would you advise? Would it be, um, let's say, the, the cerebral microdialysis or would you say, no, this is a subdural echocortical fee is the, the one you have to use? Mm -hmm. um, I see an opponent. Thank you for your question. Um, if we would make a recommendation, which is um, partly al already done by the Neuro Neurocritical Care Society, but based on smaller trials, is that there is a uh, class two, uh, level two, class uh, A evidence to implement invasive or multi 
multimodal neuromonitoring, monitoring of which partly can be invasive but in, combined instead of or, one type or combined um, in unconscious subarachnoid hemorrhage patients that that is also why we divided our um, cohort of 341 patients into two because um, Patients coming with an SAH grade four and five, they're in an unconscious state, most, mo mostly directly, they come intubated. So um, apart from doing imaging and trying wake-up trials, there is no information we can gather uh, regarding the brain. Um, so if we would make a recommendation, the recommendation would be to apply invasive neuromonitoring um, in unconscious SCH patients, which will, which will obviously cover Hunt and Hess or WFNS grade four and five. Yeah. You write it also in your own conclusions, of course, but, but you also write that it can be useful to early detect DCI. Mm -hmm. And I would say then you're too late if you only do it in unconscious or patients that are not clinically accessible. But unconscious patients starting on day one, meaning before- So only the ones that do not deteriorate afterwards, but that start in a bad condition. That's mm -hmm. what you would recommend yeah. then. And um, one very crucial aspect is, um, and that we have to kind of, um, we have identified the hard way, that is that it's crucial to, in, um, to place invasive probes before aneurys the aneurysm is secured, especially in case of complex endovascular occlusion requiring um, antithrombotic treatment because we describe the complication rate of placement of about 10% suffering a hemorrhage, which has to be seen in light of the fact that every minor drop on a CT scan and everyone, every SAH had at some point received a CT scan during their ICA stay, ICU stay um, was counted as a hemorrhage. But um, the only... Rele I would say relevant bleeding we saw was after dual platelet treatment, anti-dual platelet treatment after a complex endovascular yeah. closure. So it is crucial to place probes in unconscious patients early um, in our algorithm. Yeah. It's between CT angi angiography, identifying the aneurysm and doing the diagnostic angiography with potential direct endovascular occlusion. So that's a new recommendation, I think, coming from your research. That is our recommendation, and that's yeah. how, how we practice it. Yeah. My second question, in fact, follows this, because now suppose you will get a lot of money from the European community to do a trial on invasive neuroimaging, and you will find your friends in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands now to participate. What would be your setup of such a trial? And again, which would be the target population the same as you recommend now, or would you make it broader? And second, what would be your outcome parameter, mm -hmm. primary outcome? Because you, you correctly said that any diagnostic tool is only as useful as the effectiveness of the treatment it triggers, so you should not depend on the treatment, I think. Mm -hmm. You should have some kind of valuable yeah. outcome measure. Um, thank you for your question. Um, if we want to use clinical outcome, as, um, as, as a primary outcome in, in a randomized clinical trial, it is uh, majorly confounded by treatment. So if you would want to design this, we would need centers who would use a standardized treatment algorithm. So groups will remain comparable. Um, but it is essential, as, I, as you mentioned, and I have described that a diagnostic tool is only as powerful or useful as the treatment steps it triggers. Um, so if we want to isolate the diagnostical process and assess clinical outcome, um, then we, we will need, if we do it in a, in a randomized setting, which would be the logical next step, we will need centers who um, are willing to um, adapt a uh, standardized treatment algorithm. Um, so your primary outcome would still be a clinical outcome and not an imaging or the, or all the technical outcome. That's a very good remark. Um, the, the problem with um, not using clinical outcome is what, what other outcome can we use because we're detecting something of which there's no gold standard of detection. So if you want to compare the 
merely compare the diagnostic um, power of this technique, we should compare it against a gold standard um, investigation, which has been for long angiographic vasospasm, of which again, as earlier mentioned, has its own um, disadvantages. Um, so it will be hard to find some other standard to measure it against. What perfusion, comes to... perfusion imaging or even diffusion yeah. imaging with MRI? Yeah. That is exactly what, what comes probably right now the closest, is to compare it with CT perfusion imaging or even if, the, if we receive a lot of money, <laughs> do MRIs. You will receive a lot of money, I'm quite sure. But your outcome measure again, if you use clinical outcome, I was surprised that you used the Glasgow outcome scale because in fact DCI is an ischemic event and we have a perfect tool in fact that the ranking or the modified ranking scale. Why don't you use that scale? Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your question. That, that was an early decision and it was a decision which is actually based on our own experience with other randomized trials which are um, using the modified ranking scale for um, hemorrhagic stroke. And um, my problem with the modified ranking scale is there's some really important cutoffs if someone is able to walk or not. If someone is dependent on assistance during their daily lives. Um, but there's something missing. Um, we are one of the centers to include patients in the so-called SWITCH trial, which is, is a trial of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and decompressive hemocraniectomy. And I've been following patients for two or three years now. Um, and they're patients who have a left-sided ICH, who are not able to talk, not able to communicate, are, be are um, not bedridden, um, and are all classed as a modified ranking three, whereas their patients who are able to talk, communicate with their children, are also able to walk, but their quality of life is completely different. So at the beginning, we wanted an um, assessment tool for clinical outcome, which is more precise. Whether the, the extended Glasgow outcome scale, which is obviously more used in traumatic brain injury, is, is, is the correct tool, um, is also an, a, a very valid discussion you still point. think that the Glasgow outcome scale is uh, more, more reflects the quality of life than the exactly. ranking and scale? Exactly, and that was the goal. Okay. To have, in the, especially in the upper classes of patients doing well, reflect, reflecting how well they were doing in a more detailed way. Okay. I thank you very much for the answers and give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Bogarts. He was a member of your assessment committee and he's affiliated as neurosurgeon at the Radboud EMC. And I would like to thank him that he joins us all the way from Nijmegen here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Thank you for the invitation of being here. And I also extend my congratulations to the team. And first of all, to you with this beautiful work. So I would like to ask a question about chapter three, a methodological issue, I think, and uh, which for me is a three layer question. And I would like to start with the remarks you made in the discussion on page 48 on, um, uh, the, I can, can read it for you, the early treatment and the adequately selected patients resulted in uh, reduced infarctions. And, a discharge, this difference is not yet apparent. However, a higher rate of upper and lower severe disability in the post monitoring is observed. And this translates in those groups to better outcome achievement. So, the, so this is a shift of this group, this higher percentage. So then I would like to uh, uh, go to table uh, 3.2 and uh, at page 46, and I had a closer look at, at, at the numbers, and I was a little bit confused, but maybe you can help me about the percentage. You said in your discussion, there's a higher percentage of the post monitoring group in the severe disability combined. Uh, I could, I could not, not uh, find that, so I, but maybe you could uh, help me first with that. Maybe I see something which is not correct. Um, 
esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. So you're referring, as I understand correctly, to the to the good great great trial. Uh, 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 no, sorry, the uh, chapter T to the, to the uh, severe great uh, patients, mm -hmm. and then on page uh, 46, to be in more detail, if I see those numbers of the of the severe dis disability patients, I see they're quite similar actually. One is the post monitoring is. Uh, 48 and the pre-monitoring 52. So referring back to your discussion, there's not much of a difference. Mm -hmm. I'll you... just have a short look at, at, at my table. So one, one of the figures um, which we drew um, before publishing this was um, the modified ranking depicted as a stack bar chart at discharge six months and 12 months. And um, the goal was also to identify which groups um, benefit the most of uh, long-term rehabilitation. And um, we identified those groups in lower severe and upper severe disability at discharge, but especially after six months as having the highest potential which is also logical because they're the closest to this dichotomized cutoff to reach a favorable outcome. Um, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ben. But then the next question for me would be if we turn to uh, to the, the flow chart, the PRISMA table on page 44 of those patients included in this uh, uh, worst grade, uh, bad grade patients. Uh, they are lost to follow-ups, mm. and um, so there, there are eight lost to follow-ups in the pre-monitoring and and uh, three in the post-monitoring. And could you could you comment on what the clinical grade of those patients was, and how could this have influenced the results? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your question. Um, loss of follow-up is. Um, a major concern in all clinical trials. Um, loss of follow-up in this trial meant um, we were unable to contact patients. This would mean they're very do doing very well and move to Hawaii, but I don't think so. I think those are patients in a very bad state who are either um, in, an, uh, an, in a retirement home or in a rehabilitation facility or um, died. So um, most probably those are patients um, in an unfavorable outcome, potentially dead or vegetative state. And there is an, uh, a difference in loss to follow up between both, um, um, both groups. So there is potentially a higher loss of unfavorable outcome in the pre-invasive um, neuromonitoring group which is not counted in, which could potentially distort results towards a higher, a lower rate of unfavorable outcome in the pre-INM group. That is true. Thank you very much. And um, then my third question on this more methodological aspects of uh, the bad grade, the worst grade is um, the assessment of the uh, outcome, which was done prospectively in the post, mm -hmm. uh, but retrospectively by chart review or telephone interview, interview. Could it be that due to the retrospective nature, which might be a little bit counterintuitive, but due to the retrospective nature and depending on chart review, that you would more or less more systematically have uh, an outcome measured 
than doing it prospectively, mostly by the treating physician uh, themselves. Could you comment on that? Uh, thank you for your question. Mm. I would actually more assume the opposite. I, I would assume that firstly, of course, the quality of retrospective gather, gathered um, outcome data will be poorer um, because um, it is written down by someone else and I don't have, or the one who is assessing it does not have any, any control of it. Whereas if you have someone for you and, and the tele, the, especially the prospective telephone interviews were fully standardized and uh, use um, al question algorithms, uh, which are used in almost all clinical trials, which use extended Glasgow outcome scale as, an, as, an, um, as a primary outcome. So I would believe that the bias introduced by retrospectively gathering outcome data would be more towards um, not being more precise, but towards um, assessing patients better than they are. Because in a clinical examination and in um, reading how a patient is described, um, I think also a lot of um, s subtle um, cognitive function, um, speech function, as, as I've mentioned before, is um, very difficult to describe. And if you see someone or talk to someone on the phone, it's, um, I think, much more accurately assessed. And this is one of also one of the drawbacks of this trial that we did a before and after of which the before group was retrospectively analyzed. Thank you very much for your detailed answers. Thank you, Ms. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Terenstra, and he is also a member of your reading committee, and he is affiliated at neurosurgeon at our hospital, and I would like to give him the word. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Um, I would also like to extend my uh, uh, congratulations on, on the magnificent work you've done with, uh, together with your team. Uh, I like to read it very much. And um, um, one of the things um, that occurred to me that uh, in the introduction and also in the discussion, you mentioned that the focus of your thesis is very much on DCI the recognition and possible ways to treat it. And in, in, in that context, uh, um, it occurred to me that the first chapter, uh, the experimental chapter, chapter two, um, concerns the effects of xenon. Uh, in early brain injury, uh, not so much as in DCI. So um, my question would be more particular on how do you propose uh, an animal model to study um, DCI and effects of mm -hmm. xenon? Because there is a lot of discussion in literature about this and there are lots of difficulties. Yes. Uh, Esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, that is a very val uh, val valid point. Um, the problem with animal models and DCI is um, there is no one, no gold standard model. Um, and it is extremely difficult to identify and define DCI in animal models. Historically, it has been angiographic vasospasm, and it has been angiographic vasospasm in primate and dog models. And those were the first trials who um, examined mimodipine and their first effects and their effects on angiographic vasospasm and clinical outcome before it was translated into clinical research. Um, nowadays, um, primate research has partly luckily been re replaced by uh, mur murine models, um, mouse and rat. And it is very difficult um, because um, until now, um, mouse and rat models don't develop angiographic vasospasms. They develop microspasms, which can, which can be seen using, an, uh, using a cranial window and doing in vivo uh, two-photon uh, microscopy. Um, Dr. Bogart has published a, a really nice definition of, of clinical DCI in animal models. Um, 
it is this trans transition is difficult because of the 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 methodolo methodological and um, problems with these animal models. But um, as early brain injury is more and more um, a proven um, cause of DCI, um, we are focusing on early brain injury and the mechanisms which contribute to um, its existence. And um, the next step would be to do a uh, long-term animal trial in which the development of DCI, when early brain injury is hampered or, or prevented, uh, would be the outcome. And that would be either clinically or using imaging, um, using animal MRI, um, and that would be the transition towards um, assessment of DCI and the effects, for example, of xenon gas on DCI in animal models. Okay, I appreciate your answer. Uh, I was hoping for, for uh, your ideas uh, for a red model because there are different red models and uh, the red model you used, uh, uh, it's well known for a limited survival of the reds, uh, mm -hmm. limiting also uh, your power to draw conclusions uh, and EBI certainly is a major factor in DCI but it's not the same so um, if you have any ideas what kind of red model would you use more specifically? Um, for now in literature early brain injury is usually studied mostly using perforation models um, and as I have described in uh, chapter two, I believe from a physiological standpoint, it simulates the rupture of an aneurysm uh, better mm -hmm. because you have a connection between an arterial vessel and uh, the cranial vault. You cause an, a massive ICP increase, mm -hmm. um, which are all similar to, uh, in humans, the rupture of an aneurysm. Um, the other models available to us are cisternal injection models, um, where you also can simulate the ICP increase mm -hmm. by uh, injecting autologous blood into an into an animal's suprachnoidal space. Um, they're dual injection models mm -hmm. um, because um, rats and mouse have the capability of clearing suprachnoidal blood very quickly. Um, A possible next step could be to um, evaluate xenon or via imaging in a dual cisternal injection model because it's been proven to be a better option to assess DCI in, in neuron models. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. I give the word back to the proactor. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Dr. Arius. He is affiliated with the Department of Neurology at our hospital, if that's correct, here. And I would like to give him the word and we're looking forward to his questions. Thank you, Mr. Proactor. Also, my congratulations to uh, Mr. Candidate and uh, the promotion team. Uh, it's really nice to to have uh, such experts in uh, neuromonitoring so close by uh, in in Aachen. So my question, uh, my first question uh, refers to chapter five about uh, uh, multimodal uh, neuromonitoring. And if I'm correct, uh, you um, and there are a few options, maybe all used in uh, in Aachen in these patients with uh, ICP monitoring, PBO2, uh, microdialysis, and even uh, EEG monitoring. And I was wondering what kind of combinations uh, were you using in these patients? Uh, what are the uh, what kind of choices uh, did you make for that? And um, was there always some kind of agreement or even disagreement in uh, in these yeah, measurements? Um, mm -hmm. um, esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, in clinical practice, right now, we're trying to use 
dual monitoring, which means in our case, as is described in both trials, combining PTA2 and uh, cerebral microdialysis. Um, the advantage of having uh, two mod, um, measuring techniques, we, which are um, methodically um, separate units, um, is that because one of the drawbacks is they're very prone to technical malfunction. And um, sometimes it's difficult to use an individualized reading and to um, draw meaningful conclusion. And that is why if you have a drop PT2 and then uh, simu and, uh, simultaneously occurring LPR increase, then uh, you have an extra confirmation. So we are trying to use two monitoring techniques at once, um, which is not always possible. Um, we have been using electrocortographic uh, registration um, because there, for now, no um, actual treatments cortical spreading depolarization could trigger, uh, which are proven. We've been using it, using it more of in a uh, research context, but um, for the purpose of clinical monitoring, we've been using dual invasive neuromonitoring consisting of brain oxygen, tension monitoring, and uh, cerebral microdialysis. And agreement and disagreement be between those two measurements? That is, um, that is a complicated issue. If um, really uh, clear disagreement exists, we assume one of the measurements is false. And in clinical practice, um, then we seek confirmation via imaging, uh, using perfusion CT imaging. Yeah. Um, the goal of uh, this trial, or at least um, one, of, one, of, one of the conclusions we could make is that in patients with this bedside monitoring, we perform less imaging, but um, one of the situations where we're still depending on it, if, if there are conflicting data from uh, both monitoring techniques. Yeah. And do you still think there is a role for ICP monitoring? Yeah, because you showed in your presentation yeah, also uh, um, yeah, a, a devastating case yeah, where you also performed the decompression. I think that patient was also monitored with, with ICP. So what is your trigger to put in an extra device? Um, the advantage of brain tissue oxygen monitoring is that um, as far I know, all commercial available products simultaneously offer ICP measurement. So all these patients were, um, all these unconscious patients also received ICP. And in those patients before invasive neuromonitoring, the, there was a large group of patients who also received ICP monitoring as a standalone. Um, especially if uh, their unconscious state persisted longer and we were only depending on imaging to, ass to assess their brains. Um, then there's another aspect of ICP measurement, which is uh, autoregulation and assessing the influence of cerebral perfusion pressure on ICP and assessing autoregulation, the pressure re reactivity index. Um, we have not used ICP monitoring to this extent that it would trigger treatment we've been using it um, to assess cerebral autoregulation before and during DCI in SAH patients. Um, so so um, that's definitely a very valuable tool, which will become, I think, more and more important um, connected to ICP measurement in SAH patients. Okay. And I was wondering, did you also perform these kind of measurements in awake patients or do we have to conclude from your thesis that these measurements were done in all, let's say, sedated patients or were there also patients awake? Um, thank you for your question. Um, in chapter four, we describe a group of good grade patients, meaning we drew our cutoff uh, at Hunton has grade three, one, two, three as um, good grade. Yeah. Um, grade three are patients who are becoming drowsy, um, who are not unconscious, but are difficult to neurologically assess. Um, 
and we started implementing invasive neuromonitoring monitoring in those patients once clinical assessment was not more not any longer achievable. Um, we have not placed monitoring devices in full weight patients um, because it is from an ethical point of view difficult to do an invasive procedure uh, in someone who is also clinically accessible. Um, so no, we have we have not been applying invasive neuromonitoring in awake SCH patients. You are allowed, if you still haven't finished your answer, to finish the answer. But I got the idea that was almost concluded. I um, finished my answer. You finish your answer. Okay, Mr. Veldman. The time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss not so much the quality of your thesis, but in particular the way you have defended your thesis this morning. I request that you and your company here present, we await the results of our deliberations and the return to this room. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Mr. Feldman, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and in particular the way you have defended your thesis this morning. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And it seems that you like that a lot. Yes. <laughs> Professor Timel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. And therefore, I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Michael Maria Feldeman, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I will present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and all the members of the committee affixed with the official seal of the university. I will give the word now to Professor Klusman, who will speak the, out the laudatio. Dear Prorector, dear colleague um, Jasin Temel, um, dear members of the assessment committee here, Dr. Feldemann, dear family and friends. It's my true pleasure and honor to present the laudatio on Dr. Michael Feldemann after passing his doctorate at the University of Maastricht. His interest in neurosurgery developed stepwise. His first contact were practical lessons in neuroanatomy by my former mentor, Dirk van Roost in Ghent. They discussed imaging material from hydrocephalus patients. Michael Feldemann went deeper, studied video material and became fascinated. Already as a child, he was enthusiastic regarding science and technology. And during his last years at school, he also went into human biology. Then he considered for the first time to enter medical school. During this time, he realized his specific interest in neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. He went deeper into the topics of this course during his second year of bachelor and realized that his good sense of orientation helped him, um, helped his imagination of structure and also of function. Next, he gained experience in surgery, realized that he was a skillful and precise and decided to combine this for his future career. When asked to analyze his passion for neurosurgery, he stated that some aspects of his personality were helpful for this decision, the intention to work precisely 
and to practically apply skillfulness and technical expertise. He's a calm and concentrated worker with enduring stamina, which always helps him to deal with challenging tasks. He's good in precise planning of action and wants to give his tasks a good structure. He describes himself as non-impulsive and not seeking too many social contacts in large groups of people. Michael Feldemann recovers energy with challenges, motivation and eagerness to learn. But not more than other aspects, he expresses the wish to take care and for and to help patients, especially with the note, notion of intracranial cranial pathology, which is, of course, a major concern for any affected individual. He wants to serve patients and that thankfulness deemed a motivating benefit. The strategic approach in surgical specialty with critical indication preparation of a surgical procedure, calm but concentrated following this plan and the application of technical skills and knowledge to move the field forward to its technical limitations are ideal challenges for him. He's aware that this work and commitment exerts high pressure, but this is welcome if it goes in line with scientific activity within the team of researchers. He's open to people, nature, and he loves music. These attitudes and personality combined with neurosurgical profession is something to guarantee deep and real meaning to life. With only minimal changes, this was the English translation of his application letter to my department 10 years ago, which he wrote to me at the age of 23. I showed his application to very close confidence and co-workers and uh, they attached a post-it and it's still in his file which says looks extremely promising get him and keep him times were not always easy michael feldman suffered hits and setbacks but as expected he recovered and i cannot characterize him or our profession in a better way than he did 10 years ago I do not have to repeat his scientific merits, his dedicated commitment to fulfill the requirements for Dr. Matt, PhD, and plant habilitation to become assistant professor. Moreover, he's also eager to learn during a vascular fellowship. He's a reliable character, well respected by colleagues and co workers, always helpful, humble, and a sympathetic person. I also enjoy him seeing in partnership um, with Sarah, our very respective um, colleague, and probably soon as father. Dr. Feldemann, go ahead. I give the bird back to the prorector. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Feldman, I, I think it's nice to that you take this uh, this official title now, and I would like to congratulate you on behalf of the Board of Deans of our University, and also in addition to congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. As a personal note, I would say that I'm very pleased to see that you have really started a, what I would call a new regional thesis, because you're from Belgium, working in Germany, and defending in the Netherlands. This is really what I would say, this is the idea what we have at our university for our, our, our regional activities. And my congratulations, of course, are also at the promotion team who brought you together and who has the same aspect, both from Germany as well as from the Netherlands. And my congratulations also, I bring your family was here. Uh, so welcome to our university here. I would like to thank uh, the members of the Corona, in particular our guests from outside, Professor Nimela from, uh, from Helsinki and Dr. Borges from Nijmegen. I know that uh, it takes quite some time to do a thesis defense and to prepare the questions to read your thesis. Saying this, I think there is also time for some, I wouldn't say beer or wine, which is normally used in Belgium, but in the Netherlands, we keep it to coffee and tea. <laughs> that's, that's a normal tradition. But before closing the ceremony, uh, I would like to say that we're going to make a picture, a group picture together on the stairs of our, our uh, stairs of our university here. 
And by saying this, I'm going to use my hammer and I officially close this ceremony. Thank you very much.